I begin by expressing my deep gratitude to Ngambri and Ngunnawal peoples. It meant so much to me and to my family to be welcomed to country so generously on Sunday by Auntie Dr. Matilda Williams House and Paul Girawash House JP. I understand that they have also provided guidance on the specific practices of hospitality that are so evident in every aspect of the Lyme Connection 10th Biennial Conference. I express my gratitude to Shane Bellingham, to Levon Bandler, and to Stuart Sutherland, along with Jasmine Boys and Chanel Cabillo, Cabillo for your thoughtful care and generosity in inviting me and my family to be here. Also, I'm grateful to all of the people providing tech support, the people who have prepared all of our meals, the people who are um, taking care of this space by vacuuming and cleaning the washrooms here. It is so good to be in person with you. After many months of Zooming, in marginal hours of the day. This is my first time in Australia and the first time in the my first time in the southern hemisphere. And a few days ago I had the neck strain from looking up at the night sky to prov to prove that I have loved learning from these lands and waters and skies. My community is on St. Paul Island in Alaska, in the Bering Sea. This is a place that my grandmother always wanted to visit. Even when she was a little girl, walking along the cliffs of our island. So we have fur seals too. Ours have shorter noses, and our fur seals are delicious, <laughs> by the way. St. Paul Island feels like nearly as far away as I could be from where I stand now. But many dimensions of health, well-being, hurt, imagination, and futurity of Ananga people are aligned with the peoples that I have met while here. I have been fortunate to be traveling to the homelands of many indigenous communities over our past five weeks in Australia. It has been a good time to practice and reinforce our community's teachings about greeting new lands and waters when we come to them. I have been grateful to be here in this time, in the time leading up to, and even the time being let down by the referendum. I hope that my words and actions here are in good relation to the people who have taken care of these lands since time immemorial, to their ancestors, to their older than human kin, and to, old, to next generations. This is my first time here, but I hope it won't be my last. The bravest question we can ask ourselves as educators practitioners, scholars, and researchers is, does my work do anything? It's a terrifying question. It's also to ask, does my work mean anything? It can make you question how you spend your time and how you don't spend your time and how much time there is. It's a question that makes us contemplate, even for a brush of a few seconds, our own mortality the mortality of those around us, and who we make our work to support and to serve. The question, does my work do anything, is a scary question when we don't have a way to think about it. Or better yet, a way to think about it with others. This is why, in my mentoring, teaching, writing, and work with youth and communities, it has always been important to have another question within reach. What are my theories of change? To answer this question of, does my work do anything, alongside the question of, what are my theories of change, is a generative activity, 
rather than one of despair. It reminds us to unearth the assumptions and unsaid givens that really do need to be said. Indeed, what is your theory of change is one of my favorite questions to pose within mentoring and collaborative relationships. When I was in my early 20s, just before going to graduate school, I was working as a community educator, working alongside community organizers. And I really vibed off of the format of campaigns, of projects which had starts and finishes of our own designs. It was in a youth organization in the South Bronx in New York City that I learned most about creating organizing campaigns around environmental racism, police brutality, and racism in schooling. So I understand that Dr. Eddie Cabillo and Jenea Dwyer yesterday offered a presentation about the protest signs that indigenous students have used to contest the racist practices and attitudes in the Faculty of Law at the University of Melbourne. In the early 2000s, it was a protest sign held up by a young person from Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice, where I worked at in the South Bronx, that gave me a flash of insight about the differences between theories of change within organizing strategies. So we were at a direct action to decommission a cement plant in order to create a needed green space along the Bronx River in one of the communities with the highest rates of asthma in the nation, and also pedestrian deaths because of trucks that crisscross the neighborhoods, creating unsafe conditions for breathing and walking and biking. Some legislator's office had pre-made signs saying something to the effect of, I can't keep my children safe, and we are struggling to protect ourselves. In, the, in contrast, the organization that I worked for, rooted in community knowledge and change, had signs that said, we live here, we are experts too. Seeing the contrast in these framings has had a lasting effect on my theorizing and teaching. Without having words for what I was doing, I developed processes for young people to design our after-school programs, matching their interests with the skills and experiences that our instructors could bring to them. I was doing participatory work because this was a way to honor the young people and the communities that we were working with. It was a way to be a good visitor, a good guest. This is also where I learned about the political nature of data the ways in which data are never without a narrative, always couched in somebody's framing of a community, a family, a person, or a life. In the organizing work that young people were doing, we were always having to use data that spoke against our communities. The data were about fail failures as parents to protect, the rates of incarceration and recidivism, the harm done to people's bodies by the heavy tra traffic, lack of access to green space, police surveillance, and anti-black schooling. The data, the data were located in the bodies and communities and never in the structures of the violent state. The data were always partial because they tracked the consequences and never the perpetrators, who were always all the state actors. In education, the data that we could use to demonstrate state harm were test scores and reading levels and attendance records and rates of completion and higher education and employment success. But these data were and are nearly impossible to use because they are in fact collected in order to demonstrate the supposed deficit of black and indigenous communities and communities of color. They are collected to protect the school and the state for culpability in ongoing systemic racism and overdetermined mobility. The data that we can use in education to make our arguments are not to be trusted. This is how I ended up doing a PhD in urban education and how I ended up learning to do participatory research in order to develop data which can be used in education campaigns to affect policy change and along the way, narrative changes. I am convinced that this work is valuable to do, even when policymakers rarely listen to anybody's data anyway. 
and even though I still work in a field that produces the very kind of data that I am working to critique, often faster and with more arrogance than I could ever address. I do this within the field of education, like many of you, because it allows for the units of analysis that I engage to attend to relationships between people and institutions. I, I don't study on people, I study the relationships between people and institutions, between communities, between communities and the state. And thus, those sites of intervention are those relationships those policies, the institutions, rather than intervening on communities, on families, on neighborhoods, and individuals. I do this work in the field of education because it has a material obligation to everyday people, and it is a field based in relationalities rather than causalities, and it doesn't always know this. Finally, I do this work because ours is a field which inherently attends to changes, in society, in communities, and in people. Our field anticipates change, and when it's at its best, it theorizes change. During my doctoral studies, I worked with Dr. Michelle Fine, a psychologist scholar well known for feminist approaches to participatory action research. From Fine, I learned the insistent ethic to position participants as experts always to understand people as working within a logic that makes sense to them, even though they may want to hold more meaning and purpose. Working with Dr. Fine taught me to prioritize desire and complexity in research. That describing complexity is meaningful work when so much discussion of indigenous, black, and brown, and poor communities is to flatten dimensions so that all that is known is dispossession. One of the things that I say often is that I became a scholar because it has been a way for me to have a nonfiction writing life. Writing all the time, it has consequences for my body. I can actually write longer than my wrists and the backs of my hands can take. I have more to say than my body can type. And my work has always been with people who don't think of themselves as readers. So I'm always writing something for the community collaborators I work with. Who they don't, that they don't necessarily read. For both of these reasons, after I got tenure in my first workplace in 2014, I made a deliberate decision towards methods which are not so text-based. Even interviews and focus groups became, are, are text-based because we often ex ex uh, engage them as transcripts rather than bits of sound and exchange. So I began doing work based in photography and work based in audio recordings. In the recording work for several years, I made a podcast with students in a course on settler colonialism and anti-blackness. Our podcast, The Henceforward, attends to the relationships between black and indigenous peoples on Turtle Island, and it's a research-based podcast. In the podcast, we have to talk about ideas in which we generously anticipate our listeners holding space for the different experiences that they bring in their listening, and holding place for the lands and waters in which we are making our recordings. And also the idea that the lands and waters from which, um, from which people are doing, are doing their own listening. The theorizing happenings out of, happens out of our own voices, out of our own bodies and is highly mediated, both in terms of recording and editing and an audience that finds us. It is a way of doing, um, bringing what we do um, from behind a paywall of the academy to a self-designated public. Making recordings has been a key activity in one of my most darling projects, the Land Relationships Super Collective. This is a collective comprised of five collectives. That's why it's a super collective. Three of them are on the U.S. side of the border, two of them on the Canadian side. Three of them are indigenous collectives, um, and the other two are black-led collectives. Um, the three indigenous collectives include Ogama Mikana, which is an artist collective, Métis in Space, a podcast duo, 
and the Segorate Land Trust, a land-based project in the Bay Area of Oakland. Each of the collectives are doing rematriation work in their own ways. The collectives make regular recordings for one another called Somewhere Recordings using an app that we built with the intention of sharing story, of sharing strategies and gaining support to grow and sustain their work. The recordings take place in place where the collectives are doing their work and thinking aloud to bring other members of the super collective to their thoughts and urgencies. So this, even though what we talk about in these recordings for one another is never going to be made public, is actually the most researchy research I've ever done. The audience is direct and specific, the other collectives. We are making knowledge about how to rematriate land. We are making knowledge about the implementation and implications and futurities and relations of land back. It is my now and my future work. I would be doing this if I worked at the post office or worked at the gas station. Over the next years, as I will wind down everything else that I do in academic work, I will continue to do this work, supporting other organizations doing land return for their communities. It is my theory of change. Practically anybody who has spent more than 10 minutes with me will hear me subtly or no, not so subtly redirect the conversation to theories of change. Theories of change, to me, refers to the underlying ideas that we have about how we can use our real and our imagined agency, alone and in collectivity, to bring about the kinds of change that we want to see in the world. To ask questions about theories of change is to ask cosmological questions, axiological questions, desirous questions about the role of everyday people to make new social worlds into the existing schemes of apocalyptic dominance. I have always emphasized that questions about theories of change are pedagogical questions, not prescriptive questions, trying to get us to some secret theory of change that I have figured out and I'm trying to lead everybody else to. We are talking about multiple theories using, used in tandem, used in strategic, relentlessly loving, and courageous understanding of that broad beam of possibility that outlines every action. That shimmer that keeps us knowing that there is movement there, or that there was, or that there soon will be. I take the question of how to make change into my body and I move it through my systems with every breath. Hi, baby, I'm glad you're here. I move it through my body with every breath, every compression, even the unthought beats of my heart. I have children in this world, and the need for justice will outlast my years. So I bring my theories of change home. I let the theories that I care about be loved by the people who love me. I smell everything with the unthought beats of my heart. I allow myself to sink into the aching, thrilling sensation of walking where my grandmother walked, of views of water and life that our people have learned for, for millennia. I summon that gratitude on Ishpadina in Toronto where I walk, and I pass that gratitude through my hands and into the hands of my children. When I touch my children, I touch them in a way that I remember my mother touching me. How my mom still touches me when I pick her up at the airport. She touches me with an index finger across my cheek, a warm pressing near my shoulder blade. When I am holding my children in these hands, these hands that get pain from typing, get pain from gardening and bowling, by holding on to gym equipment, by carrying heavy laundry baskets, by mouse clicks and shoveling and tying shoes and tying tobacco ties. I get the sensation of being a mother and being my mother's daughter. I am on both sides of that touch. Some of my theories of change include rematriation, maroon societies, 
mattering, and haunting. Each of these is the response to being on both sides of that touch. There is already a future in which people live in ways that are caring and caretaking of each other. That future already exists. That we take care of one another, of more than human persons, of land and water. Futurity is a what we do now in order to make that future more present. In other writing, I have discussed how the ways in which we do research and theorizing are the same ways that we do other risky things in our lives. For me, this means that I approach research with a commitment to complex personhood, with the responsibility towards preparedness, to listening, reflection, and collectivity. The reasonable, totally fair expectation that anybody would have for participatory research is that the actions that come out of that work are aligned with its findings and insights. Kurt Lewin's famous maxim, no research without action, no action without research, concretizes this intrinsic relationship. However, it is also important for some milestones to be built in so that research can, researchers can feel a sense of completion and accomplishment. So the limitations of funding and ongoing complicated lives, the number of hours in a day and how many one can spend on a particular project, and the time and ability to live with unfinished business start as nu nuisances, but over the lifetime of a project become the barriers to the kind of action that would incite or inspire syst systematic change. Again, I'm using the words theory of change to refer to beliefs or assumptions about how social change happens, how it is prompted, or how it is influenced. I am aware that in recent years, NGOs and nonprofit foundations have expected funded participants to, act, to identify their theories of change or their logic models and other expressions of how certain activities will result in certain outcomes. In these cases, the theories of change are used synonymously with organizational models. So it's clear that what I mean by theories of change is not the same thing as what those NGOs and foundations mean, because I'm not referring to anything certain or linear. But I'm not ready to cede the term theories of change to those other evocations. Instead, I want to deepen the notion of theory and deepen the notion of change in our use of that term. Reflecting or imagining a theory of change is an ontological and epistemological activity recorded, rec related to core questions of being and knowing. Much time and human energy is invested in various political activities, but how is it that change really happens? This is a question that communities and individuals may never ask themselves. Likely, we have to ask ourselves this question again and again. The theories of change that currently operate in much academic research are painfully under-considered. They gesture towards some hope that knowing more about a problem will lead to action to address that problem. That's it. All this apparatus for a vague hope. They are willfully ignorant of the anti-blackness and settler colonialism that overdetermine action and the, the pathways to possibility. And they are, are so willfully ignorant of this that the theories of change are susceptible to those ideas of settler colonialism and anti-blackness. Across my writings, I have tried to think through the flawed theories of change that operate in educational discourse and educational research. All social science employs some theory of change. Among the most common theories of change involves documenting an individual or a community's supposed dysfunction or pain or deprivation in order to convince somebody powerful 
usually the state, usually white wealthy people, to provide additional resources or rights. It is a theory of change that mimics the legal system. It's a teleological theory of change that places the Western world and neoliberal ideology at the finish line of societal evolution. It's a colonial theory of change because it locates power and control outside of communities and requires them to appeal to the logics of the state in order to get piecemeal gains. Signithia Fordham has observed that moral arguments are rarely effective with the violent neoliberal state or other authorities. So there are consequences for engaging in research without con considering our theories of change. But those consequences are just as evident in the domains of health and education and community organizing and politics and art. Thus, envisioning theories of change is important for all of us to do in our work and in our lives and in our communities. Much of daily life tries to facilitate change, but opportunities to think together about how change happens are far more rare. Evidence of the need for action or change is Im immediately available all around us. It almost bombards our senses. We know that our society needs to change. A perspective on the larger structures of change can be overwhelming, even as it offers critical insights. The pace, the time scales, and the ends of desire change can confound our urgent desire for it. When I am reading other works by indigenous authors, I am often paying attention to how these authors are writing about change. I am trying to understand from across works by indigenous authors and within them, the stories that I hear, what they are saying about what constitutes change, what changes are needed, and what it takes to make change. That is, I'm often trying to understand how theories of change within indigenous knowledge systems hold space for the role of human agency. In addition to asking the questions with which I began this pre presentation, you in other venues might hear me asking questions about whether research, is research really the intervention that is needed? Is research going to make it better or worse? Is the research going to do what we think it will do? If we think it's going to do something specific, is it still research? Or do we need a billboard? Or do we need an organizing campaign? Do we really need research or do we need organizing? I've also been asking questions about wither research. Why are these the questions that we need to ask in this place? What questions have been asked before and how satisfying were the answers? What is the history of inquiry in this place? What research crimes have been done here and what forms of knowing have been dismissed? What questions need to be asked here, even if they can't, can't be answered through research? The context of these questions is one in which stories of pain are highly valued in academic research. That is, the research stories which are considered most compelling, considered most authentic about indigenous peoples, are social science research and other forms of research that are stories about pain and humiliation. <coughs> Reporting on that pain with detailed data and in people's quote unquote real voices is, is supposed to yield needed material or political resources. This is the prominent but again unreliable theory of change in the academy. Of course, settler colonialism and other co colonial configurations, white supremacy and heter heteropatriarchy, and the pursuit of wealth by some at the expense of others has indeed caused pain in the lives of real be people, which deserves scrutiny and exposure. It is important, 
it is important that we put st settler state violence under scrutiny. Too many indigenous women and girls and two-spirit people and trans people are murdered and missing, and too many black women are killed by police in custody. This is, of course, part of the configuration of settler colonialism, which requires indigenous erasure and anti-blackness and, anti and containment. When we don't talk about how we think change happens, we are left to assume that we are all operating from the same unexpressed neoliberal and colonial theory of change. The default theory of change is that settler colonial racial capitalism um, within this system is that if we document the damage and get enough people to pay attention to it, then together our voices will consent, convince so-and-so who is in charge to give up power and resources. This theory of change makes us overinvest in the spectacle and empathy as emotion as something that leads to change. It overinvests in the innocence of the powerful and the rationality of the powerful and in their power to wield their power over us. It does nothing to contest the order of power and how they got that power and how they got that influence over our lives. They are the actors and we are the ones acted upon. If we can prove our pain to them, then they will be made aware and this awareness will lead them to lessen our pain. And we know that this is a lie. Muskogee scholar Daniel Wildcat writes in his collaborative writings with Dakota philosopher Vine Deloria Jr. on power and place. He writes that the, this writing with Dr. Uh, Vine Deloria Jr. was concerned with the question, how shall we live? This question, how shall we live, is the driving question of my concern with theories of change. The question of how shall we live becomes even more striking in the face of almost certain climate catastrophe driven cata collapse of some of the human environments around the world. Whether through the rising of water tables or fires spreading or ice caps melting or air saturated with toxins and wars waged only for oil. The question of how shall we live has an almost unbearable urgency. So I'm using the words theory of change to refer to beliefs or assumptions about how social change happens, how it's prompted, how it is influenced. Much time and human energy is invested in various political activities, but how is it that change really happens? I'm interested again in this question for its pedagogical implications not as a prescriptive. It's worth repeating that I don't think that the, peer, the point of this question is to find a singular best answer, but instead to have a conversation, to really have it, have it together in all of its mired contestations. And so I'll turn now to the example of the Collaborative Indigenous Research Digital Garden to discuss the theories of change at work in this project. Many practitioners of participatory action research or community-based research also agree that the university should not be the only place where research questions are asked and answered. At the heart of participatory research is the belief in the usefulness of research for communities in pursuing their own social justice goals. So amidst our theories of change, there still is a role for research the Collaborative Indigenous Research Digital Garden came from my desire to describe research practice that is at the intersection of participatory action research and indigenous research methodologies. Participatory research takes community knowledge and expertise seriously, and it moves the tools and skills of research from the university into the hands of communities. Indigenous methodologies take seriously what indigenous peoples know from their relationships with lands and waters and older than human kin and works towards ensuring indigenous futures across many generations. 
So it has felt important and meaningful to work to identify and describe and support and sustain research that is both indigenous and participatory. The cornerstone projects of my Canada Research Chair have been concerned with learning more about research that is both participatory and indigenous, or collaborative indigenous research, as I have been calling it. So over the past five years, I have undertaken two major projects. First of all, to figure out whether specifying collaborative indigenous research as a field is possible and whether it is worthwhile to other practitioners. In creating these two projects, I was trying to address several problems with collaborative indigenous research going undefined. First, the ways that universities and other institutions in Canada were attempting to address the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, federal mandates. This was all creating the conditions for there to be a lot of research interest in partnering with indigenous communities but very little support for indigenous communities to be able to navigate all of this increased interest from often white scientists and social scientists who had never worked with indigenous communities before. So we're in a context where now it's trendy to work with indigenous communities, but nothing has been done to address the harmful continuous legacy of the role of research in expanding and justifying settler colonialism. So I wanted a way to differentiate research done on indigenous communities and research done with indigenous communities. To this point, when raising this critique of the history and with the superficial university uptake of the TRC calls to action, contemporary harms of exploitative and extractive and time-wasting research done on indigenous communities, I'm always asked for an example or a model of how research should be done with indigenous communities. Indeed, the demand to come up with a model of good and ethical research is often expected of me. It's probably expected of many of you in this room. And I think in part, it's to get me to shut up. In part, it's to get me to stop raising concerns about the industry that has emerged in the scramble for universities and for schools to show that they are addressing the calls to action. So we got a cottage industry when we really needed cottages back. In decolonization is not a metaphor, Wayne Yang and I began the article with the observation from Frantz Fanon that colonialism has emerged in specific ways in specific places. What colonialism looks like is not universal, even if some of the same colonial powers were driving this, the violence in the same time frame across dramatic, dramatically different geographies. So we take this to mean that decolonization is also specific to time and place, that there's never a universal theory of decolonization. Decolonization is never something that can be definitively known and predicted because of the important specificities of place. To me, this aligns with what I know about the specificity of indigenous knowledges to specific lands and waters. Of course, decolonization and rematriating relations to lands and waters is going to look different in each place. As part of this, a part of what is shaping the conditions to learn more is from those relations to lands and waters. The lands and waters in each of our places will teach us differently how to repair relations and how to move from colonial regimes of relation to ones that are informed by what lands and waters teach us. To me, it follows that the role of research in these processes, the role of research in indigenous communities' contestation and creation of the futurities that they want, is also place and time specific. This is why I have never attempted to answer the pressure to the pressure to come up with one good model of good and ethical research. It's a trap. First, the colonial con conditions of research make it impossible for there to be a pristine, good model, wholly ethical and uncomplicated by power, by extant timelines, and by contradictions. More, there are many, many more examples of research that meets community needs, 
There are as many examples as there are communities. So I don't want one model. I wanted a way to communicate that there are hundreds of examples of collaborative indigenous research. The theory of change here is to answer the narrow request for one model with abundance. I did two things at once. First, I assembled a team of graduate student workers in the Toronto Circle Lab, including Fernanda Yanchapaksi, who has been part of the project from the start, and also Diane Hill, Joe Billows, Jacqueline Scott, Marlene Villanueva, and Nicole Anise Nash. I issued them a simple task that would take them years to complete. Let's try to read what's out there at this intersection of collaborative indigenous research. I also invited 15 or so scholars from around the world to be part of our advisory board. These are scholars who are working in participatory action research or in indigenous methodologies, and many of them are indigenous scholars doing both across a range of disciplines. So when I invited them in 2017 or 2018, I invited them to advise us on a new archive of research. And I was asking them to help, help make sure that what we identified it as metadata for each study was worthwhile. I told them that I hoped to bring them together in person several times in the course of the project because at the time I could not imagine how we could have conducted our work virtually. LOL. Uh, so spoiler alert, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we conducted all of our work virtually. Meanwhile, all of the students are reading, reading, reading. I am reading, reading, reading. And we ended up reading more than a thousand studies published in the scholarly literature, but also in project reports, in websites, and other self-published venues, which allowed us to be sure to, be re to read about projects outside of academic publications. Over time, working with the designers, with the graduate students, and the advisory board, we were able to create ways of making profiles for each of the examples of collaborative indigenous research that we had identified in our reading of the more than 1,000 potential studies. Whether we were able to answer the prompts in the metadata became a way that the team decided to ultimately include the study in a set of 200 examples that were preloaded into the web tool. From the very beginning, the biggest goal of this site has been for people to add their own studies. The initial 200 that are there are there to show, show the sorting versatility of the site and not to be complete. We were trying to be sure that there was enough there to be able to show what the site could do and to be inviting enough for those, uh, uh, for those, and I hope that you are here in this audience, those of you who are working at the intersection, to feel inspired to add your own studies. We hope that these initial entries will be a small fraction of all of the studies that are added to the site. We hoped that this would address the current gap in the academy between the number of indigenous students entering the university hoping to learn research skills that can be of use to their communities, and the indigenous scholars who are in the roles that can mentor and supervise the next generation of indigenous scholars. Collaborative indigenous research requires indigenous leadership. It is by and for indigenous communities, futurities, and lands and waters. Indigenous scholars mentor others into this practice. It's like indigenous knowledges, the big difference between how we learn indigenous knowledges and no school-based knowledges is that indigenous knowledges are always coming from somebody who loves us. Indigenous students find themselves in programs without indigenous scholars or in which the indigenous scholars who are there are overwhelmed by over other responsibilities of working in institutions trying to change. We hope that this tool finds the lonely onlys out there at their universities, and I hope that it makes you feel like there are many others out here trying to do work in a way in which the research benefits stay with communities rather than only going towards the careers of professors in the university. Because there are. What this has taught me is that collaborative indigenous research is a thriving practice with many different approaches and purposes. 
Within our work in the advisory board, it took us more than a year to decide what to call this online tool that we were building. It was a question waiting in the wings of many of our conversation. Was this an archive or a compendium or a database? Thinking of my community in Alaska where fur seals grow to, um, go to grow the next generation, I wondered, is this a rookery? At some point, the web designers <laughs> were like, you just have to tell us what to call this thing. <laughs> and they needed some images that would appear on the cards, the cards on the site. I asked the designers to create them almost like Pokemon cards. You'll see it when you get there, or maybe you won't. But um, the profiles, so on these cards, which are the heart of the site. And I asked Nicole Anise Nash, who was a member of our lab, to invent some ideas and drawings of what could appear on every card. Nicole drew a series of wildflowers that grow in our region. We stayed with the idea of flowers because there could be so many more flower cards, ide icons, to make in the future. Months later, we began to think of the tool we were building as a digital garden. Joe Billows, also an artist and researcher in our lab, helped to bring more of the visual aspects of the garden to the site, including line drawings meant in some ways to refer to stitch and stitch poking styles so important in some indigenous practices in our region. We called it a garden because what is there has been tended for and curated and planted with purpose. We hope that it is a place that people will virtually visit, learn from, add to, and plant in their own practices and spaces. The most important feature of the digital garden, again, is the opportunity to make a contribution by people inside and outside of the university doing collaborative indigenous research. There is a submission form that you can download and work on in your research collectives. And once you upload the components of the profile, we have an editorial process in place to support you in adding your work to the garden. Since we opened the digital garden, we have had nearly 17,000 unique visitors to the site and nearly 40 new submissions. I hope over time that the most of the studies added to the site are for, from submissions by those who see their work as aligned with and connected to the work in the garden. In an email that I wrote to the advisory board on the night of November 14th, 2022, the night before we officially opened the Collaborative Indigenous Research Digital Garden, I wrote, of course, when we invited you to be part of the project as an advisory board member, we didn't know that this thing we were growing, we didn't know what it would be called. But now, as aspects of the project have opened, have blossomed, have been cut back, have vined around our ankles and have taken up space. We know that this was a garden all along. A garden is always incomplete and imperfect, but it is a place with the intention of growing and an awareness of the care that growth requires. The Collaborative Indigenous Research Digital Garden is a refusal to the pressure to come up with one model that is a universal way of doing research because indigenous communities are so diverse around the world. Rather than answering a narrow question in a narrow way, we answered with abundance. You ask for one model and we will give you as many ways as we can dream up from as many places as we are from. Our knowledge has come from the specificity of those places. This is a place where we could show the array of types of ethical research that indigenous peoples have created for themselves in the aftermath of this other kind of colonial and harmful research. So in the same ways that our conversations can drift to astrological signs, and we use these, hey baby, what your, what's your sign conversation to think about our relations with one another in the same way that our conversations begin with where are we from, or if they don't begin, then they get there eventually. In the same way that we actually sometimes mean it when we ask one another, how are you? And also sometimes answer it fully, even if it wasn't asked for in full. This is how I wish that we talk to one another about our theories of change. 
I wish to note that along with primarily black and indigenous members of our lab, we also have Palestinian lab members. And so I'm including information about a call to the international community from those in Gaza for immediate action towards a ceasefire. What is your theory of change these days? It truly is my favorite question. It definitely isn't small talk, not because it couldn't be small talk, but because we are out of practice with having discussions about our theories of change. It could be what we talk about when we are on an outing with an old friend, when we are texting before a date, and when we wake up startled in the night, tangled in the covers. It could be what we talk about as we brush our children's hair, when we, what we sing about in our songs, what we whisper with our hands covering our hearts and bellies, what we breathe over one another when it is share, safe to share breath again. When I say that I want the discussion of our theories of change to be among the most mundane, regularly occurring discussions across our many relations, it is so we are not reliant on broken theories of change. I don't have a predetermined theory of change that I want us all to have. I don't want the conversations about theories of change to be prescriptive but pedagogical. In wanting these conversations to flourish, I don't want our theories of change themselves to become more accurate in their estimate of causation. There can be many unknowns in our theories, many sites of wonder. When you're signing the rider, when you're riding on the subway, when you're writing on the subway, when you're reading your writing out loud at the reading, when you're writing to your readers, when you're writing home or running away from home, when you're making your home, when you're making meaning or being mean or being refusing or being care, being careful, being kin, being beyond kin, caring for older than human kin, being full with care. Let us be curious enough about one another and the world and the future to ask, what is your theory of change these days? Let this be the way that we know and love one another. Let this be what we know about our nemeses. Let this be what we know about the movements and the gardens and the children's that we grow. That's what I have to offer today. <laughs>